unsullied by us humans, sex is a very good part of human life. We live our lives in a great deal of hypocrisy, telling our children to do one thing while we do something else. The quest for control. We all would love it if our lives were a bit more controllable. Discussions within the Christian community about these questions will be primary for the survival of the Christian community. I thought I'd read a verse too, too since we're starting and uh, I, know, I don't know if everybody got a time to, to get a little uh, minute or two in the scripture. <clears throat> verse that might go along with uh, what John represents to me. It's in Philippians. You know the text that Paul talks about his life and uh, his accomplishments and uh, then he talks, he says, whatever was uh, gain I count as lost, um, that I might know Christ. He wants to uh, press on, forgetting what lies behind. He says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining ahead toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. And then he says something that's, that's very practical to us in the field of ethics uh, as we think about principle ethics and virtue ethics. He says, all of us who are mature should take such a view of things. And if in some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. It sets a standard for us in virtue ethics, maturity. We should be living up to the standard that we've lived, that we've attained this far. And he says, join with others in following my example, brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern that you have in us. I've often sought to mark out those that walk according to the pattern and imitate their lives. That's a command for us. And John is one of those kind of brothers. We often use this passage to encourage people that have been suffering and we say, forgetting those things that are behind, press on, go for it. But really the context is not forgetting the trouble, it's forgetting the great things we've done and moving on to do greater things. And Sometimes we have a great accomplishment and we can rest in that. John has had lots of great accomplishments and one of the things I'm encouraged with in his life is his humility, gentle brother, and yet he keeps doing great things and keeps moving ahead in those things. He took his uh, BA at Yale, summa cum laude, didn't stop there. Went to Gordon-Conwell, again, valedictorian, summa cum laude, didn't stop there. Went on to Harvard. Uh, graduated with distinction. Some people would just stop, get some teaching degree, but John, John wanted to go on, wanted to change lives, and, and often he's encouraged me as, as uh, I've been involved with a center that God is doing some great things in this generation, and we want to be involved in preparing people to change the world. He went to Asbury and uh, uh, was involved in ethics at uh, University of Kentucky, then came up to Chicago, uh, taught for a while at Northwestern, and then joined the premier bioethics institute in the United States, right? So that's, where, that's where you are today. And, uh, and has been doing a mighty job looking forward to what we're to face with a humility, uh, not resting in what he's done before, but looking forward to what God will do in the future in each of our lives. I hope that's why you're here because you're believing God to do great things through his church and through you. John, come and share with us this morning. <clears throat>
bring the notes with him that John, <laughs> John's planning to, uh, planning to use today as we look forward in this ministry. <laughs> You have to keep an eye on the past so that you can look forward. You don't want to totally come, come forget the past, but you bring it up and apply it to the future, right? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Flexibility is the name of the game. Absolutely. Absolutely. A small plane was, was flying and was beginning to have serious uh, engine trouble over a period of time. And finally, the engine began to falter uh, permanently. The pilot uh, opened the door into the cabin and uh, said to the passengers, I have some really bad news for you. The, the engine is out. We're going down. We're going to crash. And in fact, there's even worse news because there's four of us here and there's only three parachutes. And I'm a family man. I have, I have six kids. I have to live. So he reached into the, into the closet, took one of the parachutes, and jumped. Well, you can imagine the people were absolutely dumbfounded sitting there for a moment. And then, then one of the men chimed in and said, well, I'm the smartest man in the world. I mean, I have de I've developed all these inventions. I have all these ideas and insights yet to be developed. I have to live. And so he reaches into the closet for a parachute and jumps. Well, that leaves a, a pastor and a Girl Scout sitting there on the plane. And the pastor turns to the girl and says, say, I want you to take the remaining parachute. I've had a good life. I'm not afraid to die. The parachute is yours. She said, no need to worry, Pastor. We both have parachutes. He said, well, how can that possibly be? She said, well, the smartest man in the world reached into the closet and took my knapsack. You know, things are not always the way they seem to be at first glance. And I have to say, I loved what Vernon Ground shared with us last night about that uh, withered, non-communicative old patient who was really so much more of a person than she appeared to be externally. You know, it would be so easy to put her at the bottom of the health care list. But is there more here than meets the eye? Well, thousands of people are dying annually, even in a developed country like the United States, for lack of access to, to organ transplants. Vastly greater numbers of people die worldwide for lack of access to immunizations or antibiotics or prenatal care. The inescapable question echoes around the world when there's not enough resources for everyone, who gets it and who doesn't? Who lives and who dies? Now sometimes the problem is that health care becomes very expensive or the resources allocated to it become limited by other priorities, perhaps misplaced priorities but nevertheless limitations. So it may be a question of tight money, but it may be a question of absolutely scarce resources like organs for transplant. Now, valiant efforts have been made to save those who can't get transplants. I mean, the artificial kidney, uh, hemodialysis, for example, was developed to save the lives of those who could not have kidney transplants. But then that created a new allocation problem. Who would get the available dialysis machines? Now, there was quite an expose in Life magazine about how hospitals were deciding who would live and who would be left to die. Needless to say, those who were more socially attractive had a, a great advantage there. They tended to be the ones who were selected. Well, the matter went to the floor of the U.S. Congress. Who lives and who dies? What criteria could we possibly use to make those kinds of decisions? Now, how would you make that kind of a decision? I mean, if you had to decide right now, uh, I don't know if you've noticed the people sitting on either side of you right now, or if you're at the end, the two people who are sitting closest to you, uh, how would you decide? I mean, if you had to decide which of those two people would live and, and, and who would die. I see some people pointing. I'm not asking you to, you know, to, to, <laughs> to, to reveal the question here, but this is a serious question. I mean, this is actually what it comes down to, ultimately. And you can imagine how excited Congress was to tackle this issue. No congressional hearings were held on the matter. Less than 30 minutes of debate took place on the Senate floor. And they simply avoided the ethical issue by deciding to fund it for everybody. Now, it would be nice if we could buy our way out of every ethical dilemma that we have to deal with in health care. But it's simply not possible, of course. And what was projected to cost a few hundred million dollars at the time quickly skyrocketed to $2 billion. 
and it became clear that the next time a major artificial organ was developed, it simply couldn't be given to everyone. Ethical criteria would be unavoidable. And here we are, in just the last month or so, we witnessed the use of a totally implantable artificial heart in humans. I mean, the pressure to develop ethical allocation criteria is only going to be escalating in the days ahead. But as I say, it's an issue that's long been with us, and it's an issue that I've been studying cross-culturally for a number of years in a number of settings. In fact, in particular, I'll never forget journeying to Africa, to Kenya, uh, to work with the people, uh, the Akamba people there, spending months studying the language and the culture, and then sending, setting out to, to talk with, in depth, the people for whom these life and death allocation decisions are a way of life, day in and day out, with the, with the, uh, the medical and the traditional healers taking the car as far as we could go until it just had to be abandoned because we couldn't go any further and setting out on foot and ultimately reaching the destination, sitting down with witch doctors, herbalists, traditional midwives. Who should receive the available health care resources when there's not enough to go around? Well, to them it was obvious you should give it to the old people. I've got to tell you, the first time I heard that, that was about the, le the least obvious thing I'd ever heard, because all of my intuitions were telling me precisely the opposite, that you'd give it to the younger people. Well, after a year, I returned to the United States and carried out a study involving uh, many hundreds of medical directors all over the United States to look at a number of different criteria and how, what, what level of support they had in medical practice here in the United States. One of the criteria, of course, we looked at was, was age. What we found in that study is that uh, of the various criteria that were used, this was one that received significant support in the sense that on a one to five scale, the average importance attached to it in actual uh, allocation decisions uh, for health care, uh, particularly of a life-saving nature, uh, was a 2.7. But even more striking, 88% of the medical directors indicated that an age criterion per se would play some role in their decision making in terms of, of who would get access to treatment. In other words, that the young would be favored. Not only are age criteria supported in practice, employed in practice, but they've been openly espoused and increasingly so in the medical, the public policy, and the bioethics literature. Daniel Callahan, for example, the head of the leading secular bioethics center um, uh, from some perspectives, the Hastings Center, has become notorious for championing limiting the access of older people to life-sustaining health care. So have Robert Beach, Norman Daniels, and many other familiar names in uh, bioethics. Why this mushrooming interest in age-based rationing of health care? Well, the most commonly cited reason for limiting life-saving resources that are available to older people is the economic impact of the growing numbers of elderly people in the United States. Uh, the percentage of the United States population over age 65 has grown from less than 2% in 1790 to nearly 12.5% in the year 2000. Now, particularly fast growing are the, the ranks of the oldest people, those who are 85 years of age or older. By the year 2000, their number in the United States had topped 4.2 million people, representing 1.5% of the entire population. And this number is projected to increase dramatically in the years ahead. Now, these escalating numbers, particularly of the, the very old people, signals an escalating need for assistance, for support, including health care. I mean, those 80 and older have a substantially higher rate of illness and disability, even when compared with just people in their 70s and their 60s. Moreover, elderly people who have severe disabilities are more likely to experience chronic diseases, to be older and poor, to be more dependent than other elderly people. The mental association, then, of age and cost is an understandable one. I mean, it makes sense. And as the reasoning goes, health care for elderly people is costing more and more money. So in order to cut costs, it will be necessary to cut back on the health care that's made available to them. However, three observations challenge this simple economic rationale for age-based allocation of health care. First of all, 
Healthcare costs are increasing for a variety of reasons today. Many of these factors have no particular connection to older people. So why are older people being singled out as a group to bear a special brunt in terms of allocation of resources? Secondly, resource constraints are for the most part <laughs> due to the fact that the sum total of people's various desires exceeds the amount of resources that we have to meet those desires. Now, in a country that spends $3 billion on potato chips, for example, why would people consider preventing a certain group of patients from obtaining life-saving health care to be one of the best ways to save money? Hmm. And thirdly, when it's claimed, economically speaking, that the elderly or that elderly persons are, are receiving a disproportionate share of health care resources, the question has to be raised, well, disproportionate to what? I mean, they're not receiving disproportionate to their medical need, assuming that medical criteria are being applied equally to all people. So why do those concerned about disproportionate shares so readily assume that the appropriate basis or the reference for proportion is age, that that should be the issue here. Now, these three observations suggest that a more complicated economic trend is at work in the United States culture today than simply a concern to reduce health care or other expenditures in general in the society. There appear to be other reasons operative here for targeting elderly persons in particular for cutbacks. That life-saving care is at issue even raises the possibility that there's something undesirable about older persons per se. Now, this outlook, I would suggest, is attributable in part to the increasing utilitarian orientation of U.S. culture today. A utilitarianism is an outlook that identifies right actions as those that, that produce the greatest benefit or the, or the greatest good for the greatest number of people. When that's employed consciously or unconsciously as a means of determining who should receive resources, it predisposes us to view people in terms of whatever contributions are valued most highly in the culture today, with a bias toward contributions that are most readily quantifiable and thus comparable. Now, in the market-driven U.S. culture, economic productivity, I don't need to tell you, is at the top of the list. So it's no surprise that older people who are less likely to be viewed as economically productive are not as highly valued. They are retired, or, or even more comprehensively put, retirees, no longer productive in the ways that matters most in contemporary society. Efforts to defend elderly people by promoting an image of old age as a time for new productivity and possibilities, uh, for example, the, uh, the slogan, I'm retreaded, not retired, only reinforces this utilitarian perspective. What matters here is productivity. That's what we have to, to use to justify our existence. Now, the utilitarian way of thinking that sustains this emphasis on youth and productivity in the United States has been harshly criticized. I mean, for instance, the idea of comparing everybody's contribution has been found to be extremely difficult since you'd have to, to know everything of potential benefit to everybody and put it on the same scale for comparison. Utilitarian thinking has also been castigated for its lack of inherent protections on how badly an individual or a group in society could be treated as long as society finds it beneficial to do so. However, even if a utilitarian way of thinking were workable and theoretically sound, I mean, the question of what should count as a contribution to society still remains. I mean, the tendency to focus on economic contributions in the United States is rather different from the perspective in other societies around the world, such as the Akamba people of Kenya, whom I referred to earlier. I mean, traditionally, the Akamba view people as much more than economic beings. I mean, the great respect accorded to old, older people in Akamba society is intimately bound up with their view, their understanding of the relationship between the individual and the larger community. Now, whereas the utilitarian view in the United States conceives of the social good much more atomistically in terms of individuals who are producing, and then you get this sum, sum total, this GNP, 
uh, by which to measure significance, the Akamba people view society differently. Uh, it, it's a group of people rooted in relationships, and the older one grows, the more one becomes related to or connected to, to other people and other parts of society, and, and the greater damage that's done to the social fabric by ripping that person out by death. I mean, you would never find, for example, among the Akamba people, the situation I heard about recently uh, in a U.S. family. A frail old man to, went to live at his son's home. And at first, the elderly man ate at the table with his son and daughter-in-law and their young son, his grandson. But he's constantly spilling food and drinks and, and making strange noises. So his son set up a separate table for him in a, in a little cupboard off the kitchen and told him he had to eat there alone. Moreover, he had to use a wooden bowl rather than the, the family's dishes because he'd occasionally drop and, and break one. Well, months passed, and one evening, the son saw his own young son playing with some scraps of wood on the floor. What are you doing, he asked the boy. Now, making a bowl for you to eat with in the closet when you get old. Well, the next day, the boy's grandfather was back eating at the family table. You know, among the Kamba people, he never would have left the table, which is to say that there are viable alternatives to the economic, individualistic, youth-oriented outlook adopted by certain countries in the world, uh, including the United States. So when we look at the economic uh, especially the utilitarian context of healthcare resource allocation in countries like the United States today, I would suggest to you it is no wonder <laughs> that age criteria have such a strong intuitive appeal, though often for reasons, again, that we're not consciously aware of. It's very, very intuitive and unreflective. But is this all there is to it culturally? Well, another important shift has taken place in the public sphere, and that's the notion that biblical Christian perspectives and arguments have been increasingly labeled as, as off-limits, you know, separation of church and state and all of that. Now, what difference does that make in how a society views its elderly members? Or, to put it differently, if one is impressed with the wisdom of, of a biblically-based Christian outlook on life, what would that outlook tell us about elderly people and how we should treat those who are older. Who are elderly people? Well, two characteristics stand out at various points in the biblical writings. First of all, they are generally wise. Is not wisdom found among the aged? Job reminds. Does not long life bring understanding? Job 12. The elders, normally elderly, are therefore in the best position to give good counsel, Deuteronomy 32. And a family that's lost all of its elderly members has been severely punished, 1 Samuel 2. In fact, a city with men and women of ripe old age is considered blessed, Zechariah 8. The difference here that the wisdom of elderly counsel can make is nowhere more dramatically illustrated in the biblical writings uh, than in 1 Kings 12, in fact. Uh, there, there's a large assembly of God's people, and they ask King Rehoboam to lighten their harsh workload. Now, the king consults with two groups of counselors, interestingly enough, one a group of older men and one a group of young men. And the king's failure to heed the wise counsel of the old men dramatically leads to the breakup of God's kingdom itself into two antagonistic kingdoms of Israel and Judah. Striking the implications there. You know, it's easy to think that we don't need the wisdom of our elders, that there's really no harm done if we reject it, that we're not in the same boat, so to speak, navigating the challenges of life together. I mean, we really are, when you start to think about it, like the, the, <laughs> the man with a drill uh, who's out in deep water uh, in a rowboat with another man the first man pulls out the drill and starts drilling a hole in the bottom of the boat. What are you doing? asks the second man. None of your business, replies the first. That's my part of the boat. <laughs> well, you know, the younger people of this world cannot so neatly separate themselves from the older people in their midst. Uh, they are indeed in the same boat together. And the wisdom of the older 
is God's provision for them all. Wisdom is generally presented as a function of life experience that only elderly people have, because it's, but it's also to, important to note here, not to overgeneralize, that wisdom is also the product of righteousness and God's spirit in the biblical material, so it is possible for the young to have it, Job 32, and it's also possible for the old to lack it, Proverbs 16. Now, a second characteristic of many of the elderly, at least at some point in their life, and especially as we're looking toward the end of life, is the characteristic of weakness. Old age is acknowledged in the scriptures as a time of suffering and vulnerability. Ecclesiastes 12, for example. It's a time of failing eyes, Genesis 27. A time of failing feet, for example, 1 Kings 15. A time of declining overall bodily health, uh, for example, 1 Samuel 4. Of course, the memory can often be the, the first to go. Uh, the elderly Mrs. Pamela Wilson was riding on a train one day when a familiar-looking woman uh, sat down across the aisle from her. Now, Mrs. Wilson remembered meeting that woman somewhere before, but she couldn't recall where that was. And, and to make the situation worse, the woman nodded pleasantly and said, won't you come over here and, and, and sit beside me, Mrs. Wilson? Well, as Mrs. Wilson changed seats, she struggled to remember the woman's name. Finally, the woman mentioned her brother in the course of the conversation. Oh, yes, your brother, said Mrs. Wilson. Now, what is he doing now? Oh, he's still the president of the United States, said Mrs. Douglas Robinson, sister of Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> We've probably all had days like that. Uh, where you encounter a situation and um, just can't remember. But what's characteristic of the aging process is this kind of thing becomes more frequent, uh, more often experienced, more characteristic. I think that's the biblical perspective here. Knowing that insensitive people take advantage of the weakness of elderly people, the psalmist prays, do not cast me away when I am old. Do not forsake me when my strength is gone, Psalm 71. You see, such weakness is a general characteristic, but it's not an absolute characteristic. That's important. Elderly people should not be automatically written off as mentally or physically incapable simply because of their age. Because God often breaks through stereotypes. I mean, who would have thought, for example, that Sarah or Abraham would have a child in their very old age, Genesis 18? or that the Shunammite woman would, would have a child with her elderly husband in 2 Kings 4, or, or that elderly Elizabeth, for example, relative to Jesus' mother Mary, would, would have a child in her old age, Luke 1. Or, for example, that Jacob would father Joseph at such an old age that Joseph became special to him for that very reason, according to Gen uh, Genesis 37. You see, weakness is often there but it must be discovered and documented, never assumed. Now, both the wisdom and the weakness of elderly people call for appropriate Christian responses. The responses of respecting and protecting. We respond uh, appropriately to wisdom by respecting. Evil peoples are sometimes characterized by their lack of respect for those who are older, for example, Deuteronomy 28. It's an evil day when the young will rise up against the old, Isaiah 3. When elders are shown no respect, Lamentations 3. The young are to resist the temptations to despise old age, Proverbs 23, and instead are to recognize gray hair, in other words, old age, as a crown of splendor, Proverbs 20. People are to, quote, rise in the presence of the aged, says the Lord, they are to show respect for the elderly. Now what's interesting about this is that this particular command is one of seven commands in Leviticus 19 that ends with something like, I am the Lord, thereby underlining their importance by emphasizing God's authority to, to speak these words. But only this command of all of those commands regarding elderly people, this one regarding elderly people, adds before the closing words, the call to revere your God. It appears here that the connection between God 
and older people is special somehow. God is not simply saying that this, like all other commands, should be obeyed. The point instead is that obeying this command, in particular, expresses a special reverence for God. By showing respect for the elderly, they are revering God. So that is very much to say that in God, older people do not have a hopeless end. They have an endless hope. So if we are to respond to wisdom by respecting, then we also uh, respond appropriately to the relative weakness of the elderly, on the other hand, by protecting. God is frequently portrayed in the biblical writings as the protector of the weak, Exodus 22 and 2 Corinthians 12. And God's people are challenged to be the same, Proverbs 31, 1 Thessalonians 5. So it is not at all surprising to find God affirming even to your old age and gray hairs, I am he. I am he who sustains you. Now, that God here says even in old age, even in old age, emphasizes that, that from a human perspective, you know, it's easy to find reasons to support younger people. That, that, that comes to us obviously and intuitively. In fact, in this utilitarian culture that we live in, it's all too easy to neglect older people. But that's not what God's talking about. Even in your old age here is the promise. In fact, King David saw the same situation in his day, which is why he implores God to sustain him as he puts it, quote, even when I am old and gray, Psalm 71. Because God is a sustainer of elderly people, it's natural to expect that godly people will do the same thing, for example, in, uh, in Ruth 4. But you know, this is more of a challenge than it might at first seem, because so much in the culture, as we've noted, subtly orients us to think in terms of what we can gain by sustaining the elderly or by anything else that we do in life. Yes, what we can gain rather than a focus on what we can give. I mean, have you heard about the, the elderly man named Paul? who got a car from his younger brother as a Christmas present. Not bad. A few days later, when Paul walked out of a store um, and, and came out to the street, uh, there, was a, there was a young boy there looking uh, admiringly uh, at this new car. Is this yours? Uh, the boy asked. Well, yes, replied Paul. My, my brother gave it to me for Christmas. The boy was astounded. You mean your brother gave it to you and it didn't cost you nothing? Boy, I wish, and in that moment, Paul knew what the boy was going to wish for. I mean, the boy was going to wish for a car like that, or maybe wish for a, that he had a brother like his. <laughs> but, he, but the boy didn't. I wish the boy went on that I could be a brother like that. That's closer to the kind of response that the Bible points us to in our relationship with older people, though the culture steers us very differently. <laughs> God's identification with the plight of the helpless has understandably been heralded as the theological cornerstone for our treatment of older people. From this perspective, elderly persons are as worthy of staying alive and, and even of, re of receiving life-saving health care as anyone else. In fact, whether a particular culture values the wisdom of elderly persons or not is ultimately beyond the, beside the point. Because all persons are, are God's creation, created in God's own image, Genesis 1. They're the object of God's sacrificial love in Christ, John 3. God pours out the spirit on the old as well as the young, Acts 2. It's this basic equal worth of all that demands that all persons be respected and that the weak, accordingly, receive special protections. Now, what are the implications of all of this for age-based rationing of life-sustaining health care? Well, first of all, and most obviously, um, a straightforward utilitarian exclusion of older people because they're less productive in some sense is straightforwardly unethical. I mean, it misunderstands what is important about a person. And it rests on a philosophy that undergirds some of the most oppressive attitudes and episodes in the history of humanity. 
But there are other justifications for age criteria that do not overtly appeal to utilitarian values and justifications. What about them? Well, first of all, and I think this is important to note, it's unavoidable that the intuitive appeal of such justifications is greatly strengthened by the negative economic forces and utilitarian forces that we've been talking about already. Against such a backdrop, I would suggest that we, we need to be highly skeptical of arguments that are marshaled in support of age-based rationing of health care, no matter how philosophically interesting or, or pure they may seem to be. But that having been said, we do need to address such justifications on their own terms at face value. And so let's do so. Now, first of all, there is also an appeal to medical benefit that is sometimes made. Age criteria are often, in fact, smuggled into the practice of health care under the guise of medical justifications. Um, for example, quote, this patient is elderly, and elderly patients don't live as long as or as well as other patients, and treatment is less likely to be successful in elderly patients, so this patient shouldn't receive treatment. Now, honesty requires us to be careful and to be explicit about the, what the real issue is here. If we are truly concerned about length or quality or likelihood of medical benefit, then we, we must recognize that particular older people will be, medic, will be medically better candidates for treatment than certain younger people. So support for the use of medical criteria will require the rejection of age criteria per se. If what we're after are medical considerations, then let's invoke medical criteria. Age per se has nothing to do with it. Three other justifications for age-based rationing have also been put forward by such bioethicists as Robert Beach, Daniel Callahan, Norman Daniels. And they involve appeals to equal opportunity, a natural lifespan, and prudence. Now, the appeal to equal opportunity, first of all, contends that the most important equality at issue here is the equal opportunity to live to the same age as others. And some notion of a prima facie right to a minimum number of life years is sometimes involved in this justification. We'll come back and look at that. The appeal to lifespan, to the natural lifespan, on the other hand, holds that there's, there's some sort of natural lifespan. Maybe it's 70 years, maybe it's 80 years, a span which is normative now, rather than just a, a statistical average at some particular moment in history. And once people have reached this age, then medicine should generally no longer be concerned with extending their lives. We'll come back and take a look at that as well. And then, thirdly, there's the appeal to prudence, which holds that people should be treated equally, not so much in the present moment as over a lifetime. Health care should be provided in a way that enables all people to live as long as possible. And to achieve this end, the resources available must be prudentially distributed throughout each person's lifetime in a way that will protect, protect them against early death. Expensive life-saving resources, then, might be made available only to younger people. And then personal care and other services could be enhanced for older people. All right, let's take a more careful look, then, at, at these three justifications for age-based rationing of life-sustaining care. First of all, take a look at this appeal to equal opportunity. Now, compare, if you would, with me for a minute. Compare two women one of whom is a year older, but has recently spent much longer than that year in a coma. Now, should the younger woman really be saved over the older person on the ground that she has had, the le the, has had less opportunity to experience life? Well, it would appear rather that she's the one who's experienced more because the other person's been in a coma. But if that's admitted, then a problematically large number of, of imprecise qualitative considerations would have to be included in, in any assessment of, what, of who's had the least opportunity to uh, experience life, so to speak. One supporter of this approach admits that such assessments would be, quote, an overwhelmingly complicated task, procedurally and administratively a nightmare, as he puts it. It may be that other factors, such as one's socioeconomic, 
or even spiritual condition has much more to do with one's lifetime experience of well-being than does age per se. We reflected on that a fair amount last evening. Age provides too rough an approximation of lifetime well-being, or of physical health for that matter, to be used where something as important as life itself is at stake. Well, then how about this appeal to a natural lifespan? Now, this justification limits life-saving care to those who haven't yet reached their natural lifespan. Now, the very notion of a natural lifespan, I would suggest, requires a lot more attention here. The human lifespan has grown through the years as life-extending care for older people has been enhanced, has been developed, has been improved. An age criterion of the sort that we're envisioning here would significantly hinder medicine from extending even good quality years at the end of life. Now, such an age criterion would also demean those who are living beyond the natural lifespan. One supporter candidly admits, in fact, this problem, given the world as it presently is, as he puts it. But this problem is also intrinsic to the justification. Uh, the justification supporters assume that life extending care beyond the natural lifespan is not warranted because everything of significance by that time, by the time you reach the end of that lifespan, has been accomplished and has been achieved. You can see here uh, how an implicit productivity orientation is revealed uh, in the midst of this. What matters here is what one succeeds in doing. But the significance of life is arguably much more a matter of being than simply a matter of doing, as much as relating a matter of relating to others as it is a matter of completing tasks. Also, life goals are repeatedly altered as we, as we age, as we grow older. To suggest that people at a later stage of life usually have no goals left is wrongly to assume that the often productivity-oriented life goals of, of our earlier years are the last word in our life and existence in this world. Now, this justification may instead really support a quality of life rather than an age criterion. Even leading advocate uh, Daniel Callahan admits at one point that an age criterion to exclude elderly people would not really be warranted unless their quality of life was low. But if that's the real issue, if what we're really talking about here is a quality of life consideration, then let's be honest and let's talk about quality of life criteria for allocating resources rather than talking about or supporting an age criterion per se. Well, finally, there's this appeal to prudence. If the concern with this justification is to make more personal care services available to the elderly, and that's certainly a, a, a laudable concern, the age criterion for allocating life-sustaining acute care isn't necessary. I mean, what's needed is a greater priority placed upon personal care services when the macro allocation decisions are being made for everyone that affect what everyone gets access to. Now, ideally, this proposal has a certain appeal, but even proponents admit that it would be wrong to introduce this sort of a justification in one care health, in one healthcare setting and not in another. It would depend upon the entire uh, worldwide system being reoriented at the same time. They also admit that it may be politically unacceptable in any setting. Because the potential strength of this approach, of this proposal, lies in envisioning the resource problem as distributing resources throughout an individual person's lifetime. But politically, the issue is in fact perceived in terms of which groups are going to gain access to treatment instead of which other groups getting access to that treatment. And that's a very significant, uh, significantly uh, different perspective there. Now, these concerns that we're talking about here are so compelling that one supporter of age-based rationing, in theory, frankly concludes this is in no way recommendation for the introduction of such practices in our present world, unquote. Well, that's quite a disclaimer, <laughs> I would say. I mean, that's the world we have. That's the only world that we do have, and that's a problem. Now, such critiques of justifications for age-based rationing, of course, 
the things that we've been talking about here, looking at the specific proposals and their arguments, these considerations are not irrelevant from a Christian perspective. I mean, they expose the internal problems of the justifications themselves. They demonstrate the weaknesses of these justifications on the basis of widely held human concerns and human norms. However, a Christian perspective also gives us a larger frame of reference here from which to evaluate such justifications by giving us a clearer view of what is at stake when we're talking about age-based allocation of healthcare resources. And I want to close here with four summary observations about the contribution that such a Christian perspective makes. First of all, as we've seen, a biblical Christian perspective tells us that elderly people tend to be wise and weak relative to others, so we should be inclined to respect and protect those who are older. Now, such an outlook fosters an appropriate skepticism, I'm suggesting, about any approaches to, to resource allocation that single out elderly people as a group to receive less access to health care. Secondly, a biblical Christian perspective reminds us of the importance of a cross-cultural perspective so that our views are not unconsciously shaped by the worst values in the culture in which we live. One of the most striking teachings of Christianity is that there's neither Jew nor Greek, barbarian nor Scythian, but all are one in Christ, and all peoples are loved and sought by God. Now, if that's the case, then those of us who are steeped in the cultural values of North America need to be challenged by alternative values in other cultures, such as the Akamba people of Kenya. Thirdly, a third Christian insight that has important bearing upon age-based rationing is the sinfulness of the world. Now, people, as well as policies and institutions that they establish, are less than God intends them to be because people are fundamentally self-oriented rather than God and other-oriented. Now, while it's possible, of course, to turn from that self-centeredness to God and to others, experience and the Christian scriptures alike testify that the majority of people in this world will never truly do so. And that being the case, social strategies are needed that take this reality into account and seek to promote the best possible policies in light of it. Proposals that would be immoral if implemented, quote, in our present world, to quote the language used by proponents of age-based rationing, may be misleading and even dangerous if they depend upon the world being much different than it actually is. I mean, philosophically ideal worlds are not the world that we live in. And fourthly, finally, a Christian perspective sensitizes us to make sure that there are not other hidden injustices built into age-based rationing. Injustices, for example, that other groups than older people might be victimized by such an approach to resource allocation. What we find when we look very carefully is that women, in fact, would bear the brunt of age-based rationing of health care. Now, uh, while the ratio of elderly women to elderly men in 1960 was 4 to 5, older women now outnumber older men 3 to 2. And more specifically, of those aged 65 to 74, 55% are women. Of those 75 to 84, 62% are women. Of those over age 85, 71% are women. So particularly if very elderly people are to be barred from life-saving health care, it's predominantly women who we're talking about. I mean, 71 to 29%, that's quite a disparity. So a specific cutoff for receiving life-saving health care then would likely be set at a level to ensure a, a full life <laughs> as life is typically experienced by men, implicitly devaluing the years of life beyond that point, which are primarily the years of women. Now such victimization, as with the victimization of other vulnerable groups, is contrary to the spirit and the teaching of Christianity. The scriptures identify the male-female distinction with slave-free and racial distinctions as inappropriate categories used by one group to assert superiority over another. 
Biblical writings exhort the community to provide special protection and care to older women in particular who are frequently widows. If we are really concerned about such matters as equal opportunity and full lifespan, then we will not support age criteria for the rationing of health care. Rise in the presence of the aged. Show respect for the elderly and revere your God. I am the Lord, Leviticus 19. It has always been tempting to balance our budgets on the backs of older people. Particularly in our current utilitarian culture, it is hugely attractive to try to save tight health care resource dollars by denying life-saving care to older people. But in the face of such temptation, standing up for our elderly fellow human beings is not only ethically right, it is an act of worship. Thank you for your attention. We're going to give you a break at 9.30. That gives you five minutes for questions. So come quickly if you have uh, questions. Come up to the mic. Oh, I got one already. All right. Sam. Uh, John, this past week, <clears throat> uh, Christian Legal Society and Human Life Advocates put on seven witnesses in the House subcommittee uh, trying to um, get the Congress not to lift the ban on, fe on federal funding for the killing of human embryos for their uh, stem cells. And uh, I, I would just like to suggest you might want to enlarge your topic here a little bit. During the testimony, I, we must have had 13 or 14 Congress people all say that they had somebody they knew who had died of some disease. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that the real age-based uh, discrimination that is coming, particularly in a culture that is primarily elderly, it might have been up till now that the elderly were the easy ones to pick on. But I think the ones that are really going to get picked on now are the preborn. Mm -hmm. uh, for obvious reasons, they don't vote. Uh, we don't see them. And the, uh, no one wants to die anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you might expand. Do you, first of all, do you agree? that we may see a change in what, in ageism, so that the age discrimination that we will see going into the future will be uh, against the young. Well, in fact, I think we're already seeing that. Um, I appreciate your bringing that in. In fact, I was reflecting a little bit on that uh, in the context of uh, age-based discrimination uh, as a general rubric does cut both ways. Obviously, here we're talking about aging intentionally. But that's an excellent perspective to bring in because we do tend to think of that in terms of affecting older people uh, as the context of, of that term. But I think that the issues that are at stake here do cut both ways uh, and they need to be applied consistently across the lifespan. In fact, it's an interesting issue because politically the notion of discrimination and discrimination against certain populations and even specifically against elderly people is something that resonates you know, much more broadly, for example, than just in a, a, a conservative framework or a Republican framework or whatever. Uh, and yet, if you can invoke that rubric in terms of beginning of life issues, you have a whole other angle into those questions that is a basis of concern that resonates well with, I think, a, a broad spectrum of people uh, politically. So I appreciate your, uh, your bringing that up. That's exactly right. We have to say, uh, in a sense, uh, uh, who is a person and does age matter? And if age doesn't matter, then I think some of the exploration that we we're doing here in terms of taking a look at uh, how are we misled here? And we tend to be misled by attaching to what matters about personhood uh, productivity and ability to communicate and all sorts of things. Well, the very things that, that can be missing in older people, and we want to say, no, but wait a minute, they're still people, are the same kinds of considerations that are the kinds of things that are missing in, in the embryo or the fetus. And so that's, that's a very important parallel. Appreciate you bringing that up.
Thank you for your talk, Dr. Kilner. As a physician, I'm not sure I can dismiss age per se out of hand. Um, I think physiologically there is some changes that occur with age regardless of underlying um, physical status, although that has to be taken into account. And the difficulty I have is trying to balance, you know, my medical justification with actually looking at age. But I guess I have a hard time wrestling with, with how you how you integrate all, all of that in. I know that's something we struggle with. The common example I have is I deal a lot with oncology, and if I have an 88-year-old female, can she, she can tolerate the surgery, but I get her through that barely. Can she tolerate then another six months of chemotherapy on top of that? And how, you know, how do you present that to this patient, you know, trying to under, place it all within the context of medical justification, age, right. Right. you know, what, what's the approach there? Right. Well, that's excellent. I appreciate you bringing that up um, because we recognize that, that age does correlate very significantly with various uh, physiological conditions. And so I know at first glance when you say uh, we're not going to do age-based rationing of health healthcare, it may sound like what we're saying is we're not going to consider age in the practice of medicine. That's not what I'm saying at all. And in fact, it's, I, I really appreciate you brought that up because this is a distinction that's very important. Age is a, a signal, you might want to say, is an indication that certain, uh, certain conditions are probably present, may well be present. Um, and that would involve all sorts of uh, different specific conditions, uh, certain levels of strength, uh, ability to tolerate various sorts of things. So in other words, when you're working with somebody who is older, it is, it is very important to know what that means because there are a whole set of, of conditions to look for and in one sense to expect but the problem is where we automatically do an 100% correlation with that and say, well, this person is, is 60 now, so therefore they are going to be in a, a condition that does not make them appropriate candidate for, you know, for this or for this. And that may or may not be the case. There may, be, may be exceptions. So what we do is we use age as, a, as an indicator, as a flag that says, we need to investigate these various aspects very seriously because most people who fall into this age category have these conditions or these circumstances. So it's very important to be attentive to age, but we use age then to help us to know what to look into, what to consider, but then we make the decision, the treatment decision on the medical basis not on age per se. You see the distinction I'm making between age per se unrelated to the medical circumstances versus the medical circumstances themselves, which we better understand because we knew what to look for and we, we have a great familiarity with people in this age range. So age is very important, but just not as the actual basis for final decision making.